I'm happy, by the way, to talk at all about that meditation itself, which illustrates uh, the first part of the two topics I hope to explore with you tonight. First, uh, growing what we want to be, and then second, uh, being what we already are. Uh, with regard to the first, I'm building on a talk I gave, I think, two or three weeks ago, in which we were exploring uh, goals or intentions for the new year. And I was drawing on some of my own background in the human potential movement in the 70s, 1970s, to talk about the ways in which people often think that if they just have certain things, then they're going to be able to do various activities, which will eventually help them be who and what they want to be. But actually, what works better is to focus on what you want to be in the first place as the point of origin, as your, in some sense, level of being from which doing, from which action, in other words, naturally flows, including acts of thought, word, and deed, and then from those acts that naturally flow from what you are being, then you can have the relationship, the career success, the life circumstances to the extent that's realistically possible that you'd like to have. So beginning with being in a nutshell. So we explored some key qualities that people might like to be, uh, including ones that are valued in the teachings of the Buddha, such as being mindful, being compassionate, including to yourself among all beings, for example, being resilient, being resolute, being happy, being thankful, being skillful, being these things. So then the question naturally arises, how do we grow them? Sounds good, Rick. <laughs> how do you actually do it? And this goes to, as you may know, one of my absolutely favorite topics, uh, something that's been enormously meaningful and helpful to me in my own journey through this life, uh, growing the good inside yourself, plausibly hardwired increasingly into your own brain, nested in your nervous system, nested in your body, entwined with life and reality altogether. So how do we actually do that? This might be a little familiar to you if you know some of my material, but I, I think repetition can always help, hopefully. Uh, I'll try to keep it succinct. And if you're not so familiar with this, this is the fundamental how-to, how to use your mind to change your brain, to change your mind for the better, for your own sake and that of other beings. So let's suppose that you would like to be calmer, more centered, you know, more even keeled, whatever we want to call it, more tranquil, more peaceful. I wonder if you would like to be more of that. How do you actually do it? Well, the fundamental process of embodied learning, learning in the broadest sense, grounded within physical reality, that fundamental process involves two necessary and sufficient steps. But remember, the second step is necessary for genuine cultivation, genuine healing, lasting learning, lasting development to occur. First, we must experience what we want to grow. We must start with an experience. We must get that song playing in the inner iPod. We start by uh, experiencing, feeling, let's say, some calming, some relaxing, some centering, some kind of collecting ourselves, gathering ourselves together. All right, we begin with an experience. And then in the necessary second step of any kind of lasting, any kind of lasting development, that experience must leave lasting physical traces behind in the nervous system, physical traces in, the, in alterations of neural structure and function. If not, then the experience at the time might have been enjoyable or useful. Great. It might have had ripple effects leading to other passing experiences, but without genuinely taking into the body the fruits of our practice, there's no growth in the growth curve. It stays flat. Now, 
that, pro that process in the second step of what I call positive neuroplasticity, in which there's a change in the plastic capable of changing nervous system, that second step is fairly straightforward. It's really quite quick and easy. Neurons that fire together can wire together in the famous saying. So the longer we sustain an experience for a breath, let's say, or two breaths, there's no magic number, but there's probably a threshold unless it's a million dollar moment of needing to sustain an experience for at least a few seconds in a row, if not a dozen or two dozen seconds in a row for the experience that's being represented in short-term memory buffers to have time to gradually sift down and begin its process of consolidation into long-term storage. So the longer we sustain an experience, the more likely it is, the more capable it is of being internalized. Also, the, the more we feel it in the body, the more that the sense of peacefulness or calm is not just an idea. Ideas are okay, ideas are good. The Buddha certainly, among others, focused on wise views. You know, there's a place for cognitive therapy, great. But where the real action tends to be, especially in lasting cultivation of inner resources, inner strengths, inner ways of being, like an underlying peacefulness, um, where the real action tends to be is in emotion and sensation and even inclination, right? That's what we wanna really feel. We wanna allow it to land in the body so that in your belly and bones, it sinks in, okay? So you, you stay with it for a while. We did this in the meditation. You let it uh, come into your body. You get a sense of it sinking into your body. It's also helpful neurologically to highlight what is enjoyable in the experience or meaningful in the experience. In other words, what is rewarding about it? Because as the sense of reward in the technical psychological term, the sense of reward in an experience grows as that occurs, well, the activity of dopamine and norepinephrine, two key neurochemicals, increases inside your own brain so that the experience that you're having at the time, so that, um, the, so that the brain is actually increasingly receptive to the experience you're having at the time and more efficient at converting the experience at the time that feels rewarding into a lasting change in the living body. There's a lot of detail about this. I wrote about it in a whole book in my most recent book, uh, Neurodharma, with the Super cool cover for those of you who, like me, like the mountains. Uh, in my book, uh, my most recent book, Neurodharma, I talk about this in a summary way. You know, there are different aspects of this practice, but it really boils down to these two fundamental steps. Experience what you want to grow and then receive it into yourself. Have it, enjoy it, right? And the more often we do this and the deeper our engagement in the, in the times when we do do this, the steeper our learning curve becomes, the steeper our growth curve is as we heal and grow and develop and gradually awaken. That's the fundamental process. So you might ask yourself, <clears throat> what is it that you would like to be in 2021? Maybe you'd like to be a little bit more like uh, the proverbial duck, <laughs> off whose back uh, different forms of stresses or you know quarrelsomenesses just fall away. You'd like to be a little more like Teflon <laughs> rather than Velcro for the ordinary crud of daily life. Okay, maybe you maybe you'd like to feel more motivated to whatever's important to you, exercise, sobriety, changing habits of one kind or another. Okay, maybe you'd like to grow mindfulness or self-compassion or simply happiness because as we have uh, moments of happiness that are internalized, gradually we develop their residues, sink into us and lift our mood. So. You might think to yourself, what's one thing in particular you'd like to be more of these days? You'd like to have more of a sense of it. You'd like it to dwell more in you. Well, the more you dwell in that experience, 
And the more you take it into yourself, the more and the more that will become the habit of your heart. So what is it for you in 2021? That is one thing, maybe, if not two or three, that you feel you would like to be more of. And then when you know what that might be, you have opportunities to look for experiences of it, which then you can value, not out of clinging or craving, but out of a kind of receptive humility, appreciative receptivity that can take it into yourself. And in fact, actually, as we fill ourselves up increasingly and we be increasingly peaceful, content, and loving, then the ancient machinery biologically of craving that leads to suffering and harm, that ancient machinery, which is a drive state, craving is a drive state that is fueled by an underlying sense in the animal, including the human animal, an underlying sense of something missing, something wrong. That's what drives craving. So as we grow, the internal hardwired, woven into ourselves sense over time of fullness and balance in the core of our being, even as we manage the waves and challenges in this life, as we grow that underlying sense of fullness and balance, characterized by an increasingly core feeling of inner peace, contentment, and warm-heartedness. As we grow that, there's less and less actual basis for the craving that creates so much suffering and harm. What a wonderful process in which, as it is said in Tibet, we can take the fruit as the path. In other words, if well, the aims of practice could well be summarized as being peaceful, loving, and content, rather than fearful, angry, uh, resentful, uh, ashamed, uh, frustrated, and driven. Rather than that, you know, if those are the aims of practice, well, it's wonderful that by resting our mind authentically, increasingly upon experiences in everyday life, small, mild ones, brief ones, typically in the flow, as we rest ourselves increasingly on those qualities, we actually can take them into ourselves through the neuroplastic processes of lasting change in the brain. And as we take them into ourselves increasingly, that's who we become increasingly. So we can take the fruit of our practice as the method of practice in a wonderful upward spiral. That's great. And I'm happy to talk with you in a moment about any particular questions you might have about that process. And I encourage you to take a look at Neurodharma or some of my other books that can explain it in greater detail. Now also, this raises the fundamental question, which uh, you can see explored in different traditions. Um, you know, I think in Zen in particular, there's a real clarity actually about this combination of um, being who we are already and the process of practice. And we find this um, theme also present in the other branches of the Buddhist uh, tradition, the Theravadan branch, pardon me, and the, and the Tibetan one. In a nutshell, there is a gradual uncovering of who we already are. And so that as we meditate, for example, we can focus on being something increasingly by dwelling in it and internalizing it. Okay. So there's definitely a sense of growing something that isn't, you know, that, that, is, be, that is growing, that is becoming more present, you know, as we grow it. Okay. And also there can be an underlying sense of already being what calls our heart and finding those qualities inherent in us of peacefulness, love, contentment, wakefulness, and wisdom 
as they they feel already in our in our innermost being including in ways that may seem mysterious like how could it be <laughs> you know <laughs> that animals that evolved in Jurassic Park the Serengeti plains and the Game of Thrones more recently in the Bronze Age and onward, you know, how could it be that somehow when we look deep down inside ourselves, we find such natural goodness and inherent wisdom, wakefulness, and love? I do not have a scientific answer for that. I don't think anyone really does. And even in ways that can seem mysterious and beyond language, certainly beyond the wonderful domain of science, even beyond that, somehow those qualities that we sense as inherent way down deep can seem to extend or open into or be infused by matters that, that seem somehow transpersonal. Don't know. <laughs> and still, I'm, we can open into all of that. So, finishing up here, two major themes, gradual cultivation, sudden awakening, gradual cultivation, sudden awakening. We can cultivate qualities inside ourselves in ways that even include the recognition and inclusion and protection and appreciation of the ways that we might find them already present within ourselves. What a beautiful journey. And as we take this journey of practice, wherever we are on it, looking back where we've come with some hopeful appreciation for the efforts those previous yous have made, and as we tell the truth and be open to and honest about where we are right now. And as we even look ahead in where this journey is going, we can also be aware that we take this journey for the sake of others as well as ourselves. We can recognize what seems palpably evident that as we grow qualities inside ourselves, or to put it a little differently, as we uncover qualities uh, already within ourselves, as we do that, we you know, become easier to live with. <laughs> we become better to work with. Uh, we, we harm others less. We recover faster from silly disputes with others. We become more able to be strong and firm and unafraid as we stand up for others and speak truth to power and, and name those who would violate the two fundamental conditions of any healthy relationship or community, or country, to tell the truth and to play fair. On that foundation, we can disagree with each other. On that foundation, there can be different accounts of the truth or you know, um, prioritizations or highlighting of different aspects of what is actually factually the case. All right, people have different values, they come to different conclusions, but without that foundation of fundamental commitment, a moral commitment, to telling the truth and playing fair. Um, without that fundamental commitment, you know, how can we have a healthy politics or a healthy relationship um, in our home or at work, right? So we can tell the truth about that. We can be firm about that uh, for the sake of others and for the sake of ourselves without letting hatred poison our heart. So we start to appreciate that we make this journey with others, amidst others, and for the sake of others. Uh, and, and that recognition as well, besides the ways in which it's good for others, gives our own journey heart and dignity and a kind of nobility. Okay, so I thank you. <laughs> and let's see what kind of questions or comments there may be so far. You're welcome to say things in the uh, chat. I'm going to take a quick scan here. Uh, I think we may have time for perhaps one or two people to, you know, if you like, to bring up something and get your voice in the space. Um, let me just take a peek here 
at what people may have started to say. Okay, good. I'm seeing that people are first and foremost, or maybe not foremost, but fundamentally, and it's the first topic, get this basic idea of moving from state to trade. That's the fundamental how of any kind of lasting, healing, growing, awakening. We experience something beneficial, enjoyable or useful or both, and then we gradually internalize it, respecting the living body in the material plane, you know, opening to it and supporting lasting change within ourselves. So increasingly, we take the fruits of our practice wherever we go. Okay, so I really want to get that, states to traits, and appreciating the, the, the process of internalization, a breath or two or three or longer at a time, multiple times a day, both in the flow of everyday life and during any kind of formal practice, such as the meditation we did tonight. Okay, so let's just see. Um, any comments or questions so far? Uh, Chris asks a very relevant question. I'll speak to it. How do you bring about positive change without some craving for things to be better? So there's a very useful distinction the Buddha struck between, in Pali, two words, tanha and chanda. Tanha is craving, something missing, something wrong, whose root in the word for tanha is thirst, right? Something's missing, something's wrong. And, you know, craving is a biological endowment. Um, if you're drowning, it's natural for there to be craving for, for air. Uh, I speak as someone who nearly drowned one time, you know, many, many years ago. So, okay. But most of the time, we can disengage from the machinery of craving, including the kind of robot, robotic automaticity of milder forms of everyday craving, and we can disentangle from that and rest more in chanda, which is wholesome desire, the wholesome wish that others not suffer, the wholesome wish that children be fed and be happy, right? It's okay, the wholesome wish that you yourself progress as far as you can in this life on your own path of awakening, awakening, the wholesome wish that you, you, you know, have, have food for yourself, that, that your business flourish, that, that you find work or, or medicine or a partner that is good for you. There's a place for that. And what you start to experience is the difference between tanha and chanda. You start to experience the difference between a sense of pressure and contraction and insistence and deficit disturbance. You feel that separation. Or on the other hand, you start to feel what it's like to move into the next moment feeling already, in some sense, peaceful, contented, and warm-hearted in the core of your being. Uh, you, you, you recognize what it feels like to actualize yourself, to express your capabilities and talents, to, to value morally certain important things without the quality of pressure and contraction and um, irritability and frustration and, a, and even a drivenness, even addictiveness, without those qualities. We don't need them. And that's a wonderful distinction to feel that there can be passion, there can be fieriness, there can be the pain in your heart at the suffering of others that is motivating to you without getting contracted and pressured and driven and all weird. <laughs> I speak from some experience uh, about it. And practicing in the field of that distinction and recognizing it and, and knowing that, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of craving and hopefully a lot of a lot of aspiration with well without attachment to the results, you know, and you know, and and uh, you know, you you start to grow increasingly in that other way of being. And that's really, really useful to appreciate that we can have goals. We can have purposes, we can have preferences, we can have moral commitments, we can have traction. We can mean freaking business sometimes without the contraction and the intensity often of selfing that is so present when craving starts slipping in to our, to our goals and dreams. And that, that's a field of great practice. It's something we keep developing. I, 
I still get caught sometimes, you know, there I am grinding away or with, with my task or something irritates me or frustrates me and gets in the way, you know, it still comes up this side of complete enlightenment, maybe. Um, but increasingly, more and more, you know, we are moved toward what we value, what's important, without paying the toll, without the collateral damage of all that contraction, pressure, and drivenness. And that makes an enormous difference. Okay. So, okay. And also, as we internalize again and again, very important point, maybe my second key point here, as we take in the good again and again, um, we're less disturbed inside. We're less vulnerable to the manipulations of fear or greed or us against them rivalries. We're less vulnerable to those manipulations at any scale, including from would-be authoritarian demagogues. Um, yeah. Okay. So, okay, I'm seeing comments, questions. Maybe we'll get to somebody. Uh, anxiety. Okay, great. So uh, at 7.02 on Yanet, you might want to take a look at uh, that comment. So <clears throat> two key questions here, We're kind of in what Anyanette said, anxiety. So Anyanette says, I have a long habit of anxiety. Um, there might be a temperamental quality. Anxiety is a natural response, by the way, of course, to frightening, threatening external conditions or to a history of traumatic or painful experiences. It's understandable. No shame in it. I mean, it's a natural response while also, you know, potentially feeling quite quite burdensome. So Anyanet writes, I've had a long habit of anxiety, especially when I wake up in the morning. As I practice dwelling in the good, how long will it take to start seeing a difference in the habit of my heart? So in that, I want to say first, there's this basic notion that I've taught a lot about of matching key resources to grow inside ourselves, including what we want to be, with particular issues. So for anxiety, Key resources include calming in the body, developing greater resting state relaxation, and also a more rapid return to a resting state of calm and relaxation in the body with practice. That's one. Another thing that's very helpful for anxiety, classically, is to develop a sense of grit and moxie and inner strength inside ourselves, because anxiety is a response to feeling like there's a mismatch between our inner strength and capability and the challenges, the threats, especially the threats to safety uh, coming at us. So growing a sense of strength and having more confidence appropriately in your own fortitude. It may be uncomfortable, but you've gotten through so much. You can get through, you can get through this and overcome it and deal with it and cope with it as well. That's the second thing. A third is to do a practice I love, which is to recognize again and again that you're basically all right right now, when you are. Um, a lot of anxiety is, in effect, delusional It's a or it's anticipatory, while in the present, basically okay, now and now and now. And that um, is something that we can return attention to again and again and again when it's true. The basic okayness, not perfect, there's breathing is going on. There's enough air to breathe. The heart is beating. The mind is still working. Uh, you're still functioning. <sighs> Basically okay. Fourth, feeling supported and connected with other people or related to that, feeling that your own caring is flowing out no matter what is limited in what could flow in. And that sense of relatedness and sociability is a very primal resource for us as social mammals who evolved mainly over the long run of evolution, certainly the last you know, several million years in small bands with other people. So feeling connected can, is a resource that is matched to anxiety. Uh, and last, take appropriate action. There's no replacement for deliberate, realistic action sustained over time as best you can. You know, do what you can, do what you can, and then try to try to be at peace. So there's that basic idea right there of you know growing 
resources inside ourselves alongside taking skillful action as best we can, okay, in terms of addressing anxiety. Um, it can also help to do reasonably, you know, skillful physical interventions. Anxiety is a natural response when the body is inflamed or alarmed because of a health issue, even a what's called subclinical and yet chronic health issue. So addressing uh, what might be going on in your body as best you can. Okay. Then the question becomes, how long does it take? It's very natural and common to wake up anxious. Uh, it's not entirely clear why that is. It might be because we're at a metabolic low when we wake up. Also, we, we're vulnerable. Typically, imagine our um, animal and early human ancestors in the wild. There you are with your eyes closed, sleeping. You're kind of vulnerable. It's pretty natural. Sometimes what happens is just to let it pass, get more active, mobilize, um, get a sense of some moxie inside yourself, get moving, take some big breaths, drink some water, get vertical. These can often immediately help. With practice, with practice, as we practice this conversion from states to traits, um, how long it takes kind of depends on a lot of things, including temperament and external circumstances and how bad it's been, uh, obviously. But my own experience is that if a, if a person um, is willing to give their practice of some kind, particularly targeted around growing key psychological resources that address a particular issue and also sustaining skillful action realistically as best you can given the constraints of the, of the world in which you live. If someone actually is doing that for a few weeks in a row and um, it's not getting better, to me that's like time to think about going to another level, reaching out to professionals, seeing what other stones there might be to turn over, uh, if you're not making any headway at all after a few weeks of, you know, 20, 30 minutes of real practice, maybe spread out over your day one way or another, that's kind of a flag. Like, oh, there might be deeper causes, including in your own physical health. And that's, that's a loose, very loose rule of thumb for me. Okay. So let's see here. Lots to talk about. Um, you know, in America, my country... I forget. I think something might have happened today. It's, you know, I don't know. Maybe in the morning. I don't know. On the East Coast somewhere. You know, I don't know. Anybody have a comment or question that's sort of specific? Do to do. Anyone will raise their hand? Maybe you push. All right. I see Susan Johnson. Yay, Susan. All right. Uh, unmute yourself. Very good. Yeah. Hi, Rick. I hope hey, you can hear me. Yep. Great. Thanks. Uh, really great to talk with you. I guess my question is, is a little bit to do with similar maybe to Chris's. Um, it's about self advocacy, I suppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a person with several uh, learning disabilities, and I've always had to self advocate for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, my whole life. Um, but also, I mean, it could be translated into politically or at work or maybe in personal relationships on various mm -hmm. levels of mm -hmm. self-advocacy. So I'm trying to figure out, because usually when that happens, there is something you're hoping to change, I guess. Yep. Um, or and stop from getting worse or, or protect and preserve if it's good. You don't want people to take it from you. Okay, good. Keep yeah, going. Yeah. And so I'm having a hard time, I guess, figuring out um, without the clinging, without the craving, I guess, for yeah. things to change. How is that possible to get to action towards resolution? and that sort of thing, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a great question. And it rises a lot in sort of spiritual circles. And it's a great question. So um, first off the top, I want to say good on you <laughs> for the self-advocacy that you've done. And it's interesting as a longtime therapist and just a person, I have found that this is such a key origin point of the way I would put it is getting on your own side or being for yourself, which does not being, mean being against others. It means uh, 
recognizing the fundamental principle of treating yourself with the decency and fairness you would bring to others. It also it means bringing compassion to yourself rather than a mean dismissiveness of your own needs unmet or suffering. And uh, it means a kind of muscular uh, quality of, hmm, you know, kind of like mobilizing a certain moxie. Those three qualities, you know, principle, tender self-compassion, and a kind of muscular moxie. Those are elements in self-advocacy and being on your own side. And any one of those is a trait we can develop inside ourselves. We can grow those inside ourselves. Okay, so part one. Part two, um, it's true sometimes that when they're initially coming at us or when we initially mobilize, like, huh, you know, <laughs> at any level, all right, it's a mess. There's craving in there. You know, there's a red zone, as I call it. There's, you know, uh, maybe there's a lot of taking it personally or, okay, I got it. But with a little bit of practice and a little bit of time, it might be moments, it might be days. We kind of find our footing and we can get centered and we could say, okay, wait a second here. Number one, I see what I see. The facts are what they are. They did this, I did that, you know. Second, I value what I value. I have my priorities and I can recognize, you know, that what I'm wanting to develop uh, for myself or for the sake of others is, is virtuous, is appropriate, is okay. It's, it's allowed, it's fair, right? Um, uh, rights for them or rights for me. Rules for them or rules for me. So it's okay. You know, you've developed some clarity there about um, what you value. That, that's really helpful. Some of that's a little conceptual. Some of it is you just kind of know in your bones. Wait a minute here. You got away with something and that ain't right. It, it's kind of as simple as that. Okay, so you, it's okay. You develop that and then you develop a clarity. I'm going to pursue the same. Even if uh, others go a different direction, I'm gonna walk this path because I recognize that it's a path with heart. I recognize that it's a higher road, let's say. Also, and this gets really interesting, um, sometimes we take a virtuous path that involves costs for other people. For example, we might compete for a job knowing that if we get it and we fill that slot, that will block others. From filling it. And so we we find we know sometimes that we're going to step back in a relationship from people who wish we wouldn't, for example. Or we know that by calling others to do their fair share at home or at work or to treat us with the same standards, golden rule time, hello, that they want us to treat them, they may not like that. And they might grumble a little or a lot. All right. And so what helps there is clarity of of values, clarity of the justice, the rightness, the all rightness. One thing that helps me think about that is to realize that, um, uh, how can I put it, that I would wish for others a world in which they can pursue their own legitimate aims within the lines, not cheating, not lying, but within the lines. So if I would wish that for them, I am entitled myself as well to those opportunities and those standards. And then last, it's helpful to know inside yourself what's your plan, you know, to know what your plan is, what you're revising over time. And then, then you work your plan, you know, the old line, plan your work, work your plan. Uh, so this might sound a little abstract, but I'm trying to be kind of systematic here <laughs> to a fault. I'm a writer, I kind of, I like this way, you know, and uh, so be it. Uh, <clears throat> That really helps, I think, that really helps. And then, <clears throat> then you keep seeing what's happening. And along the way, try to, it's, it's easy. You know, we're scruffy animals. Or <laughs> we, you know, maybe as beings we're perfect, but as a species, I think we have some work to do. But anyway, uh, and you know, along the way, maybe you get a little edgy, you get a little contentious, get a little grumpy. You know, maybe your initial movement is a little, a little, um, pushy, I don't know, something or other. But then, you know, you clean it up, 
sorry, didn't mean to, you know, do, you know, say it like that. And still it's okay. I'm going in this direction and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you make of all that? Yeah, thank you for that. I was madly writing notes as you were speaking. <laughs> so I think that's really good. But I do feel like self advocacy and it taking a toll on the person um, go hand in hand a lot of the time. You mean a and, toll on yourself or yes, impact on others? A toll on yourself, mostly. Okay. That's what I was meaning by that. Um, and so, yeah, just trying to create positive change that's in your realm of uh, possibility, I guess. Yeah, can I interrupt you there, Susan? If, uh, I don't know if any of this will land, but I'll just kind of offer it uh, from my experience with other people and may, you know, maybe a little intuitively here. First, it's really helpful to grow what I call the caring committee inside, a sense of inner allies who are cheering you on. And it's lonely to self-advocate when you feel like you're all alone. Right, it's one of the scariest things in the world. And as a kid, I'm sure you had to do that a lot, unfortunately, and as an adult too, perhaps. And then if you think of belonging to a class of people, any kind of class of people who are not privileged or dis disempowered in various ways, certainly historically and currently women, as well as other groups, you know, uh, you feel like you're swimming upstream, you know, you're clawing your way uphill through mud, it's hard. So it's, so it's very important to, internalize and try to grow based on real things. This is where other people come in, certainly, but a feeling that others are with you and supporting you. And I've, I've written about my caring committee and maybe a sense of your own family who have your back and they're on your side. Yay, right? Um, th that's really important. And to tune into that, that others are with you. That's, that's very important. One. Two. Hey there. That's great. I love kids. I've done a lot of work with kids. Anyway, um, another thing is just, I would just maybe ask ourselves, what's the friction inside uh, related to advocating? And is there any internal friction of self-doubt? The Buddha talked about hindrances. At some point, I'll talk about the five classic hindrances. And one of them is doubt, and sometimes it's said that it's the worst of all because anything can be doubted, right? It applies to literally everything, doubt. Uh, it might be a, inner voices that are, you know, quietly muttering in the background, no, no, you'll hurt others, no, no, be a good fill in the blank, no, no, you don't deserve it, no, no, what right do you have to da, 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 you don't actually know, you know, whatever. So what is that internal friction? And it's very interesting. Um, this weird phrase came to me when I was doing a lot of traveling on business, frictionless contentment. I'm working on it, but frictionless, what would it be like? Like frictionless self-advocacy, frictionless being on your own side, you know, the internal friction being mindful of whatever those headwinds might be inside yourself that you're you're moving against. Yeah, that, that could be useful. Um, and then last, um, that can be this very powerful, there are kind of two ways to progress towards something, you know. One is the familiar one in which we have a goal and <laughs> we swim toward it. Uh, sometimes, what feels like upstream, you know, and and I think honestly there is a there's a certain virtue and no you know nobility even in working your way uphill, harumph, <laughs> still going, okay, but wow does that get tires tiring, and you know it exposes us to what's called willpower fatigue, just it can be very powerful to have a sense rather than of working really hard to get over there of what we're trying to be, like an advocate for ourselves, to instead, and this is very resonant with our theme tonight, of giving yourself over to what is already true. In other words, to and being lived by a purpose already. So you might think about it in terms of like, what are you advocating for? So let's say um, basically, calling others to reasonable respect of you, 
like you call yourself to reasonable respect for them, right? For example, and or you want to advocate for a particular thing to happen or not to happen at home or at work. And we can feel, you can feel the goodness of that, the, the righteousness of that, the legitimacy, the validity of it, the wholesomeness of it, even the wisdom, even you know, the benevolence for the greater good of it. The, the, you, could, you could feel the love in it, if that's relevant, at the bottom of it. Feel that. And then in the gesture I'm making here, you feel that it lifts you and lives you and carries you along. And so it is that moving through you which speaks truth to power, makes a clear request, says it with dignity and not hemming and hawing, doesn't you know, kind of sputter, but instead comes into a situation with self-respect and dignity and traction and gravity. It is that moving through you that carries you along. That's a very different feeling, isn't it? And um, we can explore that and, and feel increasingly given over to and lived by those qualities and purposes in us. Yeah. Thank you, very helpful. <laughs> okay, well, if that was useful. Well, let's just take a minute here. We're at the end tonight of letting whatever's beneficial here for you sink in. Um, maybe you realized something for your own life. Maybe you had a sense, uh, you felt something, a growing calm perhaps, or one of my favorites, a kind of weaving together of lovingness and peacefulness. Let's just sit together for a minute or so as we finish here tonight. Letting it land. Whatever is useful. Letting yourself be it. Letting it be you. Ah, good. <laughs>